Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church is committed to growing together in Christ. And one way we grow in Christ is by His Word as we learn from the Bible. Our prayer is that through these sermons, you will grow in your love for Jesus and trust Him more. Today we continue in our series of talks drawn from the book of Proverbs called Wisdom for Life. Here is ancient wisdom from God for living in today's world. In this talk, Hayden Smith looks at what Proverbs says about leadership. We've all known leaders we admire and leaders who have abused the privileges and power of their position. Many of us are leaders in our work, community and families. As well, even without an official position, anyone who influences others is exercising leadership. Hayden shows us what leadership is and what Proverbs says about the qualities of wise leaders. But before we hear from Hayden, let's listen to the Scriptures. This is Proverbs chapter 16, verses 9 to 16. In their hearts, humans plan their course but the Lord establishes their steps. The lips of a king speak as an oracle, and his mouth does not betray justice. Honest scales and balances belong to the Lord. All the weights in the bag are of his making. Kings detest wrongdoing, for a throne is established through righteousness. Kings take pleasure in honest lips. They value the one who speaks what is right. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, but the wise will appease it. When a king's face brightens, it means life. His favour is like a rain cloud in spring. How much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, here is Hayden. When I think about leadership, I think of Optimus Prime from the 1986 animated movie, Transformers the Movie. It features a planet that turns into a transformer, right, okay? Um, We... We love good leaders, right? And I love Optimus Prime. He's kind of, he fights for what's right. He's got wisdom. He's a team player. Plus, he's a truck that blows stuff up, right? Love it. And um, it's true in life that we really do love good leaders. Now, we're talking silliness with cartoons, but um, whether it's in the context of politics or sport or great moral leaders, we want to look for people who will actually set a great example for us and who will help us to grow as people. Uh, This is what Proverbs says, and tonight we'll be looking at Proverbs and also the broader teaching of the Bible on leadership, which is not an easy topic, but I think it's an important topic for us to study together. But leadership is important. Let me show you from Proverbs 29, verse 2. Show me a righteous ruler, and I'll show you a happy people. Show me a wicked ruler, and I will show you a miserable people. And so whilst it's true that we rejoice in good leadership, it's also true that there are some who are wicked. And um, sadly, um, for me, over the past few years, it seems like whenever I'm kind of checking the news, there's example after example of failed leadership, of people who've made bad and damaging choices, and that has implications for them, for their family, and for the communities that they lead. We've seen it in politics, in sport, in Hollywood, in boardrooms, in marriages and homes and in churches. Too often, to compound things, those people have been protected. They've been shielded by institutional or cultural power. And there have been people who've had the opportunity to step in and say, no, 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 that behaviour is not tolerable. But sometimes, and again too often, it seems as though those people, they either feigned ignorance, we didn't see it happening, or they were indifferent to the damage that such behaviours were causing. 
But my hope today is that we'll see that whilst ultimately we must not put our hope in people, because this is what it says in Psalm 146 verse 3, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. And Proverbs 11 verse 7, hopes placed in mortals die with them. All the promise of their power comes to nothing. Rather, we're not to, supposed to put our trust in the under-shepherds. Another word for under-shepherd is pastor or minister because we are flawed and given to failure. But to put our trust in the great shepherd, the good shepherd, Jesus, who is faithful even when people are not. But I trust that we'll also see that one of the gifts that God has given us is godly leaders. Whilst none of us are the archbishop, and wield that kind of power within this Anglican church structure, each of us does have power. Each of us does have the ability to influence others, and I pray that we will do so with integrity, wisdom, and a servant heart. Um, what do we mean by uh, leadership or power? I'm going to borrow um, a definition from Clay Scroggins. He says somewhat simply that leadership and power is simply influence, and every person here has influence the ability to influence the physical world through baking or through engineering, the ability to influence others through instruction or through empathising with them, the ability to influence ideas and the culture in which we live through writing or the arts, the ability to influence the world through finances or resources, the ability to influence even our own thoughts and actions through self-leadership, as we discussed just a couple of weeks ago. Every person exercises power and authority in different contexts, in different ways, to different degrees. But it is true that some people have become a little cynical about that. They're a little bit cynical about how power has been used but really misused, and they've sought to respond to that in different ways. Uh, one of the ways that I've seen people do that is I was reading a blog from Melbourne that talks about how any relationship that has a power imbalance is fundamentally and by definition, an unhealthy relationship. But the difficulty I see with that is actually we see that part of what it means to be human is to be in relationship with different people. Some who have a little more power, some have a little less, and sometimes that changes over time. This morning uh, in the congregation at 10.30, I looked out and I saw some parents who were caring for their children. Their children were in a power dynamic relationship with them. Where they had little power, their parents had more. And it was a relationship of care. But what was interesting to me about that is I looked across the room, I saw another relationship where there was a child caring for a parent. A child who was in their 60s, a parent who was in their 80s. And that same relationship had shifted. The power dynamics had shifted, but it doesn't follow that because there was a difference in power that there was necessarily a problem. You see, part of... What it means to be human is to be part of a series of relationships that are defined by influence. There's a, a, a quote by um, a, a woman by the name of Diane Langberg. She spent like more than 50 years studying trauma and abuse, which is wild. Uh, the fact that she can stay in that job for such a long time. She studied at a local level and also at national level. Like she's been to Burma and seen how the damage done there at a national level has caused trauma across generations. Um, but this is what she says about power and vulnerability. We are all frail, finite creatures. There are no exceptions. Vulnerability and power are intertwined, engaged in a dance that is sometimes beautiful and sometimes destructive. This complex relationship is poorly understood and seldom discussed. She says later, we all have the ability to influence others and be influenced by others. Welcome to the human race, she says, i.e. part of being human is being in this dynamic, this dance of power and vulnerability. And that's partly by design and for good. In um, Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom is personified as the vehicle by which God created the world. In uh, Proverbs chapter 30, we see something similar where um, uh, the person speaking says, I wasn't there when you made the world. And Proverbs 30 and Proverbs 8 are designed to make us remember back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is fascinating to us because not only do we see the greatest demonstration of power, not just 
cultivating the world, that is shuffling things together to see what patterns we can make, but God calling the world into being with a word. And um, what's amazing about that is not just that God demonstrates his power, but that he delegates his power at that point. He calls us as image bearers to be vice regents, to be representatives. And that pattern we see in creation, where God creates and then delegates, we see the same thing when God resurrects the Lord Jesus and then commissions the church, delegating authority to the church and great power will come on you from on high in the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, I'll quote um, Diane Langberg again. This is a long quote, but I think this is a really important quote to understand if we're going to understand power. This is what she says. In Matthew 28, 18 and 19, Jesus says, All authority, all power is given to me, therefore go. Jesus holds all authority. This means any little bit of power you and I have is derivative, i.e. it doesn't belong to us by rights, it's given to us by a higher power. We are dispatched under his authority. Well, what does that mean for you? Are you verbally powerful? The word gave you that power. Are you physically powerful? The mighty God who breaks down strongholds and sustains the universe gave you that power. Do you have a powerful position? It is from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Do you have power or knowledge or skill? The Creator God, whose ways are beyond finding out, gave that power to you. Do you hold emotional power with others? That power came from the Comforter, the Wonderful Counselor. Do you have great financial power? If so, it is merely a small portion from the One who holds all riches. Any power that you and I hold is God's. I want to say that one more time. Any power that you and I hold is God's. It's been given to us by Him. Why? For the sole purpose of glorifying Him and blessing others. If all power is derivative, then Christians should hold it with great humility. Power is not something to boast in, but to be used for the benefit of others. Um, this morning, um, uh, my wife, Libby, was on the coffee machine, which means she arrived a little early, which means uh, three of my kids were here a little early, and um, at one point, I heard my wife, Libby, telling Sebastian off because he was on the deck here as the 8.30 people were filing out. And he had found a very large stick. And he's six years old. And he thought this was the greatest thing in the world because what do you do with a stick? You flail it. That's what sticks are for. Um, here was a kid who had extraordinary power... <laughs> to knock old people flying. <laughs> but of course, if you have power, you need to make sure that you use that power properly, responsibly. And um, I'm not sure about you, but I'm not sure that he was yet at an age where he is old enough to wield a stick amongst older people. I'm not sure. How so there, if you think about how to use power, Proverbs has a few things to teach us. Firstly, wise leadership requires integrity. A throne is established through righteousness. Proverbs 16, verse 12. Righteousness here means doing the right thing, doing what is good and true. And kings, that is rulers, that is people in authority, they are to rule by what is right. What's the alternative to that? Well, the alternative to that is this. By justice, a king gives the country stability. That sounds good. But those who are greedy for bribes tear it down. The wicked accept bribes in secret to pervert the course of justice. Proverbs 29 and 17. The alternative to doing what is right is doing what is immoral. That is, here is the picture of um, a ruler who accepts secretly bribes. This is someone who will gladly pervert justice. This is someone who will gladly overlook the cause of the needy and the oppressed in order to get a kickback and get a little richer and a little more influence. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And what's interesting about this verse is it talks about bribes being accepted in secret. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 3, it says this, the integrity of the upright guards their way. Integrity is a really interesting word. It comes from the word integer, which we know because it means number, but not any number, a whole number. Integrity means whole. What it means by that is, as you scratch through the surface and get to the inside of the person, the inside matches the outside. What they're like in private matches what they're like in public. 
That is, if you look at a person who shows integrity, if you see what they do at home, it matches what they do in public. Sure, they might look a little grumpier or a little scruffier at home, but fundamentally it's the same person. A person who lacks integrity is very different when no one is looking. Christian leaders are to show integrity. How do you do that? Well, partly you can't be one person if it's not clear to you who you are. If um, the value is integrity, the question you have to ask is, who am I? Back to Clay Scroggins in his book, How to Lead When You're Not in Charge, he says this, near the core of what makes a person a leader is their sense of identity. The way you see yourself is determinative for your life and for the decisions you make as a leader. He gives an example. It establishes your sense of security when you face doubts. And we all face doubts in the decisions that we make. It's what enables you to process your emotions during tense conversations. When you feel threatened, do you have a clear sense of who you are in this conversation? He continues to say, though much of your identity is formed at an early age, your identity is always evolving, so it's never too early or too late to begin processing your sense of self. This is all very technical language, right? Um, but the point that he's making is this. We all define ourselves in different ways. Dom defines himself as a blues supporter. Or it could be that Michael defines himself as a musician or Anne-Marie as a doctor or whatever it is. We've all got these different ways of defining ourselves. But which one of those is the most important? Of all the ways in which you could define yourself when someone says, tell me about yourself, which of those shapes you more than any other? What lies at the center? And one of the dangers of leadership is this, that when people start to think that what they do defines who they are, that's a problem for leadership. I'll tell you why it's a problem for leadership. It's a problem for leadership because when someone questions your leadership, they actually, in that circumstance, it feels like they're questioning you and your value. And so you start to become protective of your influence of your reputation, of your power. And once you do that, all of a sudden, it's not about how you can be a blessing to others, it's about preserving your own identity, and that is wildly toxic. So how do we find an identity that is other than what we do? Well, for Christian leaders, um, for those who are involved in the spiritual care of others, there's, um, we're called shepherds, right? That's where we get the word pastor from, it just means shepherd, right? And there's a a beautiful thread in Scripture to do with shepherds. You might think of Psalm 23 or Ezekiel 34 where um, God says to the shepherds who are doing a terrible job, you guys are fired, I'll come and do this myself. Or John 10 where Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. Or as we come to 1 Peter where those who are under shepherds those who are pastors, we look for the return of the great shepherd. Being a shepherd is a beautiful thing. But for those of us who are involved in Christian leadership, that must never define who we are fundamentally. I'll come back to um, another quote from Diane Langberg, who is just bringing such helpful truth. She says this, Have you been called to shepherd the lambs of God in some fashion? You may be a shepherd as a pastor, a teacher, a counsellor or a parent. Do not forget that long before God called you to be a shepherd, he called you first and foremost to be his lamb. A silly stupid lamb who follows others into ravines and allows themselves to get devoured. She concludes by saying, you are a lamb who must stay very close to the great shepherd. Our primary identity in life, if we are to be of eternal value to the Father, is not that of a shepherd, but that of a lamb. And what that means is, if we know we are loved, if we know we are secure in Christ, our job goes really well, that's great. Our job goes really badly, it's not the end of the world. We are popular, we are unpopular. Whether we are experiencing threat of intimidation, as Proverbs discusses, or the temptation of financial inducement, a bribe, a bribe is on the table. These things don't define me. Rather, I know who I am, therefore I can act with consistency and godliness and integrity. Leaders are to be people of integrity. If the first question is, who am I? The second question is, what is true? Where do we get truth from? Because secondly, leaders are to be wise. Who do you turn to for advice? Maybe your mum or your dad, maybe a sister or a brother, someone who you know. Who do you turn to for advice? 
because leaders are to judge, to govern with wisdom and justice. I'll read to you from Proverbs 8, 15 and 16. The me here is wisdom personified. By me, kings reign and rulers issue decrees that are just. Proverbs 8, 15 and following. Leaders are to judge, to govern, to make decisions. That's what leadership is. And such good leadership brings stability as we read here in Proverbs 28, verse 2. When a country is rebellious, it has many rulers, but a ruler with discernment and knowledge maintains order. We need, though, to have that good judgment. We need good advice. Proverbs is, we'll talk more of this when we come talk about speech um, in the coming weeks, but you need people who will speak the truth to you, even when it hurts. But, of course, the best counsel comes from the Lord. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 says this, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. I don't know if you know this, um, but when um, in Israel, the king was anointed and crowned, he had one job to do first, which was they gave him a copy of the law of the Lord, and they gave him a pen and a scroll, and they said, write the whole thing down in your own hand, because this is to be your guide. And he's to read it every day. He's supposed to write it on the scroll and write it, as it were, on his heart. If you want to be a leader who is godly and wise, you need the wisdom of God, and therefore you need to be a person who loves the Word of God. All right, thirdly, you need a servant heart. What is my role? Um, Leaders are marked by integrity, wisdom, and a servant heart. Question one, who am I? Question two, what is true? Question three, what is my role? Your role with the power that you have, is to serve. Power is for the people. Um, There's a really interesting bit at the end of Proverbs, Proverbs 31, verses 3 to 5, um, where there is advice for a king. Let Let me give that advice to you. Here it is. Do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer. Why? Well, of course, it's damaging to the person, It's damaging to those involved, but the reason is there at the end of this verse. Why? Lest they drink and forget what has been decreed, that is the law of God, and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. You've got a job to do, King. You've got responsibilities. You don't have time to be wasting your life in that way. Your job is to do what? Well, you can see it there. It's to make sure that the rights of the oppressed are maintained. Later in that very same chapter, it says this, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Leaders are to use their influence to protect and to provide for others, even when it's costly. Now, you might know the author, um, Simon Sinek. He's a um, kind of leadership guru guy, author. He wrote a book called Leaders Eat Last, released in 2017. This is what he said. The true price of leadership is the willingness to place the needs of others above your own. Great leaders truly care about those they are privileged to lead. You can easily judge the character of a man, he means person, by how they treat those who can do nothing for them. You see, the Lord Jesus has set an example, and it seems as though the secular world is cottoning onto this, and it seems as though the Christian church is playing catch-up as well, but there's nothing new here because Jesus taught us this. Matthew 20, 26 and 27, his disciples are jostling for honour and positions of influence, and they're like, can I be the two I see? Can I be the two I see? And Jesus is like, well, just hang on, just slow down. Let me explain something to you. This is what he says. The rule is in this world, lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it'll be different. Whoever wants to be leader among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. To lead wisely is to have integrity, wisdom, and a servant heart. To put those who you lead first. I want to close with three quick applications and an encouragement for us to look to the Lord Jesus. Here's my first application. Ask the Lord of the harvest. We need leadership. We should be calling for leaders. But who should we be calling to? We should be calling to the Lord of the harvest. This is what Matthew 9, 37 to 38 says. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The Lord Jesus says, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. 
We need good and godly leaders in our homes and workplaces and schools. Um, I wonder, would you pray that we would have more scripture teachers being raised up to teach kids about Jesus? Would you pray that we would see more people um, in the villages, like in the retirement villages locally, thinking, you know what? God's called me here next to these people with a, with a purpose. I'm going to share the gospel with the person over the back fence. Be praying for the work that's happening in Christian groups on university campuses all across Sydney and Australia. We want to see more people who are commissioned. I don't care whether they're paid or not paid, um, whether they get an official title or not, more people raised up for this important work. Thank God that um, Paul is coming to join us in this work. God has raised him up for this moment. Thank God for Simon and for Rach. They've entered into a period of discernment and prayer with like, I want to study, I want to figure out whether this whole vocational ministry thing is for them. I wonder, for you guys... If God called you, if you're going to pray, raise up workers, be very careful of that because it could be you, right? If God called you to that role, would you answer him? Because I tell you, right, I mean, one minister described um, being a minister in a church in Sydney as this. It's exhilarating and exhausting. It is both of those things, right? It is crazy. It's hard work. It's not easy. But there is nothing that I'd rather be doing than working alongside you in the cause of the gospel because people are dying apart from Christ and we have good news to share. Now, what what happens if as you start to pray and as you seek discernment, as you engage with the encouragement of others and someone taps you on the shoulder or maybe as you're praying, you think, maybe this is what God wants me to be doing. Would you listen? Whether that's in semi-retirement, whether that's in, um, after uni, whether that's um, when the kids go to school, would you consider being a worker in the harvest? I don't want, to want 20 people to come up to me tonight being like, great, we'll join the staff team next year, let's make the budget work. But I would love it if each of you would find the courage to pray, Lord, if that's what you want for me, I'm a bit nervous about it, but I'm not a no, and see where that prayer leads you. Now, we need to be very careful of overestimating our abilities when it comes to leadership and the use of power. Because if we think, oh, no, no, that that kind of stuff doesn't happen to me. I use power in a good way. I help people. I would never fall into sin like those people I see on the blogs, on the podcasts, on the news. That would never happen to me. We need to be very, very careful here. Um, Jeremiah makes this abundantly clear. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart, that is our hearts, are deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I want to be very clear about something. Sin, deceit, and the misuse of power happens in ordinary churches. And you know what this church is? An ordinary church. And therefore, we need to be very, very careful. We need to be vigilant. We need to take sin seriously. Um, A character in a book called The Thicket, um, a novel, describes sin in a very similar way. The character called Jack said this, to some extent I find sin like coffee. When I was young, I had my first taste of it. I found it bitter and nasty, but later on I learned to like it by pouring a little milk in it. And then I learned to like it black. Sin is like that. You sweeten it a little with lies and then you get so you can take it straight. Just undiluted, pure self-indulgence and sin. It's a very slippery slope. Do not tolerate evil, self-interest, pride. Do not tolerate those things in your life and surround yourself with people who will help you stamp them out. And one of the ways that we can surround ourselves by people who will help us stamp this out is amplifying the voices Um, and what I mean by that is um, I heard this talking about the role of women in business and part of the thinking was that often not always but often women's um, opinions are not necessarily taken seriously in the context of corporate the corporate world so they'll say an idea it's ignored they'll say the same idea it's ignored and then a man will stand up and say I have an idea say exactly what that woman just said they'll go that's a brilliant idea well done Dave 
And the idea of amplification is if you hear someone who has a quiet voice, someone who doesn't have a position of authority, rather than ignoring them, rather than taking that idea as your own, give them a platform to amplify their voice. Say, sorry, Sarah, could you say that one more time? That was really helpful. Thank you. What do you mean by that? I think she's onto something. Now, that's in the context of the corporate world, but as we think about structural power, and particularly around those people who would raise a concern in the context of the home or a school or a church, how do we help to amplify their voices? Because if someone does have a concern, let me be quite direct here. Imagine someone has a complaint about me. In that context, many of us, and this is not a, a good or a bad thing, our gut response is not Hayden, like he's a good guy. There's been a misunderstanding here. And so the person who would raise that complaint knows that it's very likely that they won't be heard. And so it's easy for them to stay quiet. But if they find the courage to speak, we must listen to them. We must support them. And the reason we support and listen to them is three reasons. Because we care about truth, we care about godliness, and we care about people made in the image of God. Because I could have made a terrible mistake. And so if you care about the person making the complaint, and if you care about me, and if you care about the name of Jesus, we must listen carefully. Sadly, that has not always been the case. Diane Langberg says the following statement, and I fully support it. She says this, For those who have been abused, my prayer is that in reading this, you will feel seen, protected, believed and comforted. Some of you have left the church after experiencing abuses of power in the very place God means to be his sanctuary. If you see the church as a place of danger rather than of safety, please remember that sadly the church often fails to look and act like Jesus, making it easy to believe lies about who he is. If you have been hurt in the context of the church, I'm sorry. But do not confuse the sin of the church with the Saviour who is good, even when we are not. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. So the three application points are ask the um, Lord of the Harvest to make sure that we honestly assess our own weakness and to amplify the voices of the quiet. Let me close by pointing us to Jesus. We've discussed power tonight and we have discussed that power can be misused. What does it look like, you reckon, when you ramp up power to 11? <laughs> like, what does it look like when you take power and you keep going to the next level and the next level and the next level until you see power in its ultimate form? What is the ultimate expression of power? Well, there's um, one uh, person, uh, a, a political theorist, a kind of philosophy guy. This is what he said in his book in 1956. He said this... All politics is a struggle for power. The ultimate kind of power is violence. And we kind of see that, right? You seek to coerce people, to control people, and when no other power works, then governments resort to violence. But I wonder, is this true? Because for Christians... We understand things a little differently. I read to you Matthew 20, 26 and 27. Let me give to you 27 and 28. Whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Why? Why is servant-heartedness at the heart of the Christian faith? Because for the Son of Man, that is Jesus, did not come to be served, though he had every right, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus saw violence up close. He endured violence, but his suffering is an expression of his service, ransoming sinners from death. I wonder if you looked at the scene. I wonder if you looked at the picture of Jesus dying on the cross, and I ask you this question. Where is the power in this scene? I wonder if your first instinct would be to go to violence. It's the most obvious one. People are literally hammering nails into bodies. But I wonder if that's to misunderstand where the power truly lies. Because in the crucifixion of Jesus, we see 
a greater power. We see someone who takes the building blocks of hatred and fear and violence and transforms them into forgiveness and hope and love. That's real power. To see lives transformed and see people changed and reconciled to God. Andy Crouch puts it this way. In the light of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, Christians have come to the glad conclusion that violence is not the ultimate kind of power, far from it. For all its twisted terror, it is nonetheless a weak, defeatable and indeed vanquished kind of power. True power is creation and the truest power is resurrection, the new creation that can restore flourishing even when violence has done its worst. I do hope that we pray that the Lord would raise up harvest workers. I do hope that we pray that we will accept that leaders, including you and me, are flawed. And please pray for your leaders. I do pray that we amplify the voices of those who need help. And remember, for all of the failures of church leaders and for all of your failures, we serve a king who shows integrity and wisdom and a servant heart. He has established his throne in righteousness and we gladly follow after him. Amen. Thank you for listening today. We pray that God will use what you've heard to help you grow in Christ. For more information about Emmanuel Church Glenhaven, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. We look forward to your company next time. Bye.